In this lecture, we will be discussing a solved problem on the shortest job first scheduling. In the previous lecture, we have already discussed about this algorithm and we have seen how it works and what are its properties. So here we will be seeing a solved problem on this SJF scheduling algorithm. And this problem was also asked in GATE 2014 in computer science. Alright, so let's see what is this problem and how we can solve it. So here is the problem. An operating system uses shortest remaining time first scheduling algorithm for preemptive scheduling of processes. Consider the following set of processes with their arrival times and burst times in milliseconds. So what the question says is that an operating system uses the shortest remaining time for scheduling algorithm. So we have already seen in the previous lecture that shortest remaining time for scheduling algorithm is another name for this shortest job for scheduling algorithm. And it is using a preemptive type of scheduling for the processes. And then the arrival times and burst times are given in milliseconds as shown in this table. So we have four processes P1 to P4 and the arrival times are given here in milliseconds and the burst times are given here in milliseconds. Now the question is the average waiting time in milliseconds of the processes is blank. So we are supposed to find out what is the average waiting time of these processes. And we have four options. A 4.5, B 5.0, C 5.5 and D 6.5. So let's see how we can solve this and how we can find the average waiting time for these four processes if they are using shortest remaining time for scheduling algorithm for preemptive scheduling of processes. So remember it is preemptive. That means when a process is using the CPU, if other processes of shorter time comes, then that process will be preempted. Means a process that was using the CPU can be preempted. The CPU can be taken away from it and given to the process that has the shorter remaining time. Alright, now let us solve this problem. I have just copied down the above table here so that it fits on the screen. It's the same table. So in order to solve the problem, we have to find the waiting times for each of these processes one by one. And after that, we have to calculate the average waiting times. So for that, what we have to do is we have to first form the GAN chart for this set of four processes. So let us see how can we plot the GAN chart for this set of four processes. So here is the GAN chart for this set of four processes P1 to P4. So if we look at this table, we see that the first process to arrive was process P1 at time 0. So process P1 arrived at time 0 and then since it was the first process to arrive and since there were no other processes at that time, the CPU was given to process P1. So here in the GAN chart, we see that at time 0, P1 arrives and P1 gets the CPU at time 0 and begins its execution. Now if we look at this table, we see that at time 2, P2 has arrived. So when P2 arrives, we see that the burst time of P2 is 4, which is less than that of P1, which is 12. So P2 has to be given the CPU. So what will happen is P1 will be preempted. That means the CPU will be taken away from P1 and P2 will be given the CPU because it has a shorter burst time as compared to P1. So at the second millisecond, P2 arrives and the CPU is given to P2. P1 is taken out. So P2 is now executing. And if you look at the table, P3 arrives at time 3 or the third millisecond. And what is the burst time for P3? It is 6 milliseconds. Now let's see what was happening in the GAN chart. P2 was executing. So P2 started its execution from the second millisecond and at the third millisecond what happened? P2 completed one millisecond of its execution. So what is the burst time of P2? It is 4. So at the third millisecond P2 completed one millisecond of its execution. So at time 3 P2's burst time or the remaining time is now 3 milliseconds. Now P2 is having 3 milliseconds to be executed. And at that time P3 arrives and the burst time of P3 is 6 milliseconds which is greater than that of P2. So P2 will not be disturbed and it will be allowed to continue its execution. So it is continuing its execution and up to what? Up to the 6th millisecond because P2's burst time is 4 milliseconds. So 2 plus 4 is 6. So up to the 6th millisecond P2 continues its execution. Now if we see at the 6th millisecond P2 releases the CPU. So now who is going to get the CPU next? Is it P4? No, it is not P4 because the arrival time of P4 itself is 8 milliseconds. But we are only at the 6th millisecond right now. So what are the other processes that we have now? We have P1 and let us see what is the burst time of P1. Is it 12? It is not 12 now because P1 already completed 
2 milliseconds of its execution. So the burst time of P1 is now 10 milliseconds. So we have P1 with burst time of 10 milliseconds and P2 has already completed its execution. So P2 is not to be considered anymore. And we have P3 whose burst time is 6 milliseconds. So we have P1 and P3. So P1 it is 10 and P3 is 6. So which is the smaller one? It is P3. So P3 will get the CPU at the 6 millisecond here. So P3 begins its execution and now let's see what happens. So as P3 begins its execution, it goes from 6 millisecond to 7 millisecond, then from 7 millisecond to 8 millisecond and at that 8 millisecond P4 arrives and the burst time of P4 is 5 milliseconds. So will P4 get the CPU? If you just look at this table, you may think that yeah, P4 should get the CPU because P4's burst time is 5 which is less than that of P3 which is 6. But if we closely observe in this table, we know that P4 arrived at the 8 millisecond. So let us see what is the status of P3 at the 8 millisecond. At the 8 millisecond, P3 already completed 2 milliseconds of execution from 6 to 7 and 7 to 8. So let us see what is the total burst time of P3. It is 6 milliseconds. So since it already executed 2 milliseconds, 6 minus that 2 will give us 4 milliseconds. So at the time 8 when P4 arrives, the remaining burst time of P3 is 4 milliseconds, which is less than that of P4 that is 5. So P3's remaining time is 4 milliseconds which is less than that of the burst time of P4 which is 5 milliseconds. So P3 will not be disturbed. P3 will be allowed to continue its execution and it will continue until it finishes. So the total burst time of P3 is 6 milliseconds. So 6 plus 6 is 12. So up to the 12th millisecond P3 executes. Now what are the remaining processes that we have? Let us see. So P2 has completed, P3 also has completed. Now we have only P4 and P1. Now what are the burst times? We know that P1's remaining burst time is 10 milliseconds and P4 which has not even got the CPU once, its burst time is 5 milliseconds. So if we compare P1 and P4, the smaller one is P4. So P4 is the one going to get the CPU. So P4 gets the CPU at 12 milliseconds and it will execute for how long? For 5 milliseconds. So 12 plus 5 is 17. Now at the 17th millisecond, the last one which is P1 will get the CPU and it will continue execution for 10 milliseconds. So 17 plus 10 is 27. So at the 27th millisecond, P1 completes its execution and here we have the complete GAN chart for this set of four processes. So we have to always keep in mind that this is preemptive and whenever a process arrives, we have to closely observe what is the status of the process that is executing currently. We have to see its remaining burst time, not the total burst time but the remaining burst time and depending upon that you have to compare with the process that arrives and whichever is lesser will get the CPU. So that is how you form the GAN chart for a preemptive shortest remaining time first scheduling. So how do we calculate the waiting times? We have already discussed the formula in the previous lecture. So this is the formula. The waiting time is the total waiting time minus number of milliseconds the process executed minus the arrival time. So the waiting time of a process is calculated by seeing the total waiting time which is visible in this GAN chart and from that we subtract the number of milliseconds the process executed prior to the total waiting time and from there we subtract the arrival time. So that will give us the waiting time for a particular process. So let us calculate that one by one for processes P1 to P4. So here are the waiting times for processes P1 to P4. So for P1, what is the waiting time? The total waiting time of P1. So let us see where is P1. P1 lastly executed over here. And what was the total waiting time? It was 17 milliseconds. So we have 17 minus the number of milliseconds the process executed prior to that. What is that? If you see in this GAN chart, P1 already executed 2 milliseconds before coming here. So minus that number of milliseconds the process executed which is 2 milliseconds minus the arrival time of P1 that is 0. So if you subtract this we will get 15 milliseconds which is the waiting time for P1. And similarly for P2, what is the total waiting time? We see that P2 is seen only here in the GAN chart and the total waiting time was 2 milliseconds. And the number of milliseconds the process executed before that we see that P2 never executed before that. So it is 0 and the arrival time of P2 that is 2 milliseconds. So minus 2. 
that will give us 2 minus 0 minus 2 that is 0 milliseconds. So if you look in this Gantt chart also we can understand that P2 arrived at the second millisecond and as soon as it arrived it got the CPU so it did not have to wait so we have 0. Then similarly for P3 what is the total waiting time? P3 got the CPU at the 6th millisecond. So the total waiting time for P3 is 6 milliseconds minus the number of milliseconds it executed prior to that. We don't have P3 before. So that is also 0. And then the arrival time of P3 that is 3 milliseconds. So 6 minus 0 minus 3 is 3 milliseconds. And then finally for P4, if you see what is the total waiting time, it is 12 milliseconds. So 12 minus number of milliseconds it executed prior to that. We don't have P4 prior to that. So it is 0 and then the arrival time of P4 is 8 milliseconds. So 12 minus 0 minus 8 which gives us 4 milliseconds. So here we have calculated the waiting times for processes P1 to P4. Now we can easily calculate the average waiting time. So the average waiting time is 15 plus 0 plus 3 plus 4 divided by the total number of processes which is 4 and that gives us 5.5 milliseconds. So this is the average waiting time for the processes P1 to P4. So we are getting 5.5 milliseconds. So let us see if we have 5.5 milliseconds in our option. So coming back to the question, if we see the options, here we have option C which is 5.5 milliseconds. So option C is the answer to this question. So I hope this was clear to you how we calculate the waiting times for a operating system that uses the shortest remaining time for scheduling for preemptive scheduling of processes. So thank you for watching and see you in the next one.